Welcome to the 12 Days of Christmas, where we've been looking at the various characters in the Bible story. And we're up to the 10th character in the biblical record, in, at least in the Christmas story. And that's the character of Anna. Now, you may remember we left off last time with Simeon, who poured this great blessing upon Jesus and then turned and said some really alarming things to Mary. And then we appear, it appears, walked away in the discussion. Now, now, Anna shows up kind of as a transition there. And here is what we read of Anna in Luke chapter 2, verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Israel. Now, it's just a few short verses, three verses, but we learn some things about Anna and Jesus in the process. First of all, no sooner had Simeon left, maybe even while she was there, than Anna appears. So just imagine Mary and Joseph, baby Jesus in the temple, they are interrupted with, uh, with these two characters, Simeon and Anna. The fact that both of these individuals, Simeon and Anna, are called out by name means they were well known in the temple. And, and that would make sense since they were both old and had been doing temple work there for a long time. Now Anna, we learn, was a prophetess, which means people expected her to give them a word from the Lord. The, the language about her marriage here is a little awkward. Um, it may be best understood as her husband died at the end of their seventh year of marriage, so she'd been a widow a long time. And she had either been a widow for 84 years, putting her over 100 years of age, or she was now 84 years of age. Either way, she's really old. But that's not the point of the text. The point of the text is Anna's spirituality, because that's also discussed here. This is something she was known for. She was consistently in the temple. How long? Well, at least 80 years. So that goes back, just think about it. Prior to Herod even doing his renovations in the temple in 39 BC, she's back before that, always coming to the temple, always doing what Anna does. And what did she do there? We we're given three words, worshiping, fasting, and praying. And she did these things day and night. So let's talk about praying day and night for a moment. Prayer is this idea that we're dependent on the Lord, right? And Anna, like the widow in 1 Timothy 5.5, 5, was that dependent. In fact, Paul writing there in Timothy, 1 Timothy 5 says, she who is truly a widow, that she's left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. Kind of sounds like Anna in the Luke chapter two account. Notice this, if you will, that supplications is the word that means I'm totally dependent. And we pray night and day because we're totally dependent. Now it's hard for us to understand that kind of life and death dependency, but a widow would have known that in biblical times. Think about it, there was no social security, there's no husband's life insurance policy to lean on. They prayed as if their lives depended on it because their life depended on it. Now Anna's, though, just doesn't pray in need, we realize she worshiped and fasted. Now the Greek word here for worship is the word lateria. It's a word I love. It's Half the time it's translated as worship, the other time it's translated as service, which means both are a part of worship. In fact, in Romans 12, 1, you may remember that we are called there to be living sacrifices, and the text goes on to say that this is our reasonable worship or our reasonable service. So we know that Anna is serving in the temple. That's part of her worship, undoubtedly doing whatever she can do to help, even in her old age. I know I had a friend of mine who used to pastor up in Rhode Island and he told me this story that when he first started pastoring there he had this older woman who used to work in the office volunteer in the office all the time and she was diagnosed with cancer and that cancer was slowly beginning to to take the life right out of her but she loved to serve and my friend John said that he could remember her coming into the office when it was time to run copies of bulletins or other papers that were needed and she literally, they, they, he said, we brought a chair up to the copier for her and she would sit next to the copier. She would probably run about 20 copies through and then she'd be so tired, she'd just lay her head down on the copy machine and rest for a little bit until she got enough energy to do it all over again. And he said, you know, um, 
people would say, John, you can't let her do that. You you can't. You, you got to interrupt. That's that's too that's too difficult for her. Don't you understand? And, and and my friend John said, but I looked at her and understood. This was her act of worship. She wanted to serve. It was almost like she would say, please don't take this away from me. So this is how I want you to see Anna in the New Testament, serving well up into her 80s, always doing that as an expression of worship. Now there's something else as well here. There was prayer, there was worship, but there was also fasting. Now fasting would only deepen your dependence on the Lord. In fact, Don Whitney in his wonderful little essay, definitely worth reading out on the internet, um, entitled Nine Reasons for Fasting Other Than Its Swimsuit Season. Um, he makes the case for Christians fasting as a voluntary abstinence from food for spiritual purposes. And he said it's very different than, um, than the non-Christians purposes for fasting. And he gives us nine reasons spiritually to fast. So think of Anna here, the, this wonderful biblical character. Think of her fasting for nearly 80 years, right? Day after day, she would have a time of fasting and it would accomplish these things in her life. Fasting was meant to strengthen prayer, to seek God's guidance, to express grief, to seek deliverance or protection, to express repentance, to humble yourself before God, to express concern for the work of God, to overcome temptation and dedicate yourself to God, and finally to express love and worship to God. All of these make Anna a strong spiritual witness as one who hears from God. Think of it, eight decades of serving, fasting, and praying 24 seven, and then baby Jesus appears. The text says that she came up at that very hour, which meant that while Simeon finished his blessing, uh, all of a sudden Anna was there. Eugene Peterson translates it this way, at the very time Simeon was praying, she showed up, that is Anna, and broke into an anthem of praise to God and talked about the child to all who were waiting expectantly for the freeing of Jerusalem. Note, this isn't, look how sweet baby Jesus looks. This is Anna, the prophetess, making a connection between baby Jesus and the freeing of those in Jerusalem. Paul said it this way, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And Romans 6 reminds us, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Anna looked at the baby Jesus and declared your freedom.